Open with me to the book of Acts chapter 19 in verse 1. And we're continuing to uh, study the book of Acts. And um, I, I believe this morning uh, the Lord has a very specific and clear word for us. In verse 1 it says this, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, passing through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And then he said to them, he says, well, into what then were you baptized? And so they said, into John's baptism. And how many know we're going to have any baptisms today? But, but look what this says. Then Paul said, well, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance. And how many know that's what water baptism is? You go down. It's an outward, conf outward confession of an inward experience that you've been saved. It says, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe in him who would come after him, that is Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, the men were about 12 in all. Verse 8, he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. It says, but when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way, before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. This morning, I, I have a message for you out of the book of Acts, chapter 19. And I want to talk to you for a moment on the subject of powerless disciples. Powerless disciples disciples. Now, I want to speak it to you because I believe that when you feel powerless, God's able to take you from being powerless to powerful. And I believe that I know the title seems a little negative, but by the time uh, you're done hearing this word, you're going to go from being powerless to powerful. Amen. Can you say praise the Lord? Amen. You may be seated. In, in the book of Acts, chapter 19, uh, we, we read here. And how many have been enjoying this Acts series? We read that Paul made his way to Ephesus. And when you read here in Acts, the, the city of Ephesus was a strategic city because the city and actually the church experienced revival in the midst. History tells us that the revival that actually began right there in the city of Ephesus eventually spread all throughout of Asia. Uh, Ephesus was actually the gateway of the revival that took place in Asia. Now, how did this revival happen? When you really study it, there are actually six significant markings that give us a bit of a backdrop for revival. So if you, if you study this revival in Ephesus, there were six uh, things that actually stood out. The first thing is that miracles were released in the lives of the people. And isn't that something we've been seeing throughout the whole study of the book of Acts, that the word of God was accompanied with power, with miracles. Somebody say miracles. Another thing that you see here in Ephesus is that the fear of God impacted the hearts of men. The fear of God impacted the hearts of men. And, and I think it's important to know that for, for, for a heart to really change, it must encounter the fear of God. When you really understand, or, or let me put it this way, the awe of God. It's the awe or the fear of God that turns and changes the hearts of men. How many could say amen? amen? Another thing you see is that many surrendered to Christ. They were not only impacted, but they began to surrender to the Lord. The fourth uh, component to this revival, the fourth marking of this revival in Ephesus, 
was that many of the false prophets were exposed. The false prophets were exposed. And what you see here in the scripture is that there were some false prophets. There were some people that were not right. Can I hear an amen? And because of that, there was great opposition that rose up when the when the false prophets were confronted, when these uh, witch doctors and, and uh, you know, people who weren't telling the truth were confronted. How many know great opposition rose up? Because how many know whenever you tell the truth, that's when opposition rises up? Have you been facing opposition in your life? And, and that's when, fifthly, we see that the people were burning superstitious scrolls and charms. So we're talking about revival. How many want to experience revival in your life? And, and I think when we look at this scripture, we, we, we see that if revival is going to take place, there's going to have to be a spirit of confrontation. Come on, somebody. Because nothing changes until something changes. Can I hear an amen? And so there was a spirit of confrontation and these false prophets and these people they begin to take these superstitious scrolls and these charms. And basically what they were doing is they were casting magic out of the region, casting this magic out of the region. Some of you know what I'm talking about when I talk about magic or I talk about tarot cards or I talk about santeria. Come on, come on. You know what I'm talking about. How many know what I'm talking about? And they begin to take some of these cultural uh, things. And, and I think we understand that you, you have the, 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 the tarot cards, you got Santeria, you got even some of these cultural images, you know, that stuff that we were raised on Rasa. Come on now, I'm just trying to apply it. Some of these different things that we were raised on and they begin to take those things and they begin to cast them out of the region, the, the, these, these cultural memorials, all these different things. Because what was happening is that those were the things that were stopping revival. And how many know God doesn't know, need an idol for assistance? I feel like I need to say it this morning. Doesn't need no tarot cards. Can I hear your name? And all he needs is his spirit and people that are yield to the spirit of the living God. See, Paul really encountered a lot when he came into Ephesus, as the scripture tells us. And, and the Bible says that there was there was a sixth reason for revival is that Paul actually preached, taught and trained some disciples in the school of Tyrannus. For two years, Paul, who came into the region, he began to feel something. And as a leader, how many know when you're a leader, you, you always can feel something. He came in. I, I think maybe Paul was expecting uh, uh, something different because the Bible says that there were some disciples in the land. There were some disciples there in Ephesus already. And when Paul came in, he, he asked them, he says, uh, have, have you received the Holy Spirit when you were saved? And, and I think Paul was a little bit shocked to hear them say, we hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit. We hadn't even heard of Pentecost. We didn't even hear that there was an outpouring. And I think Paul, being a little bit dumbfounded, said, well, wait a minute, what were you baptized in then? Can I hear an amen? And they said, we were baptized in, in John's baptism, which was water baptism, which was the baptism of salvation. Not that baptism leads to salvation, but it is the evidence of salvation. But Paul looked at these disciples, and what he began to see is he began to see powerless disciples. It's not that these men were bad. You know, they were thinkers. They were reasoners. They were philosophers. They were deep. Talk to me. But they were powerless. That even with disciples in the land, there was still all this witchcraft going on. Does it make sense to you now? That even with disciples in the land, there's still idol worship. There's still tarot cards. There's still santeria. There's still... Come on, black fist in the air. Talk to me now. And how many know God's not in any of that? How many know God wants to send a revival to the land? How many know that God wants to pour his spirit in a fresh and new and living way? How many know God wants to bring change to our society? You see, he encountered some disciples who were powerless. And in the scripture, Paul asked them this critical question about the Holy Spirit. You see... 
And what Paul encountered were disciples that were powerless, that had no power. What, is it, what does it mean to be powerless in, in your life? What does it mean to be powerless? Well, to be powerless is to have a demand placed on you that you are unable to produce for. To be powerless is to have a demand placed on you to, to be, be unable to produce for. Let, let me kind of put it this way. How many of you have a phone? You know, you got your phone with you. It never leaves your side, does it? You know, I was with my young, my daughters yesterday. We spent the whole day together, and, you know, we're all, I need a charger, I need a charger. I, I think that when the battery on their phone dies, something in their heart begins to die. It's just something like <laughs> It's almost like their life is connected to the power of their, like the phone's dying and then they're dying. Like, I'm, I'm melting like the witch in The Wizard of Oz. So I went and bought them two chargers. But the thing is this. It's like your phone. And, and your phone is dying. And what do you start doing? You start looking all over the place for a place to plug it in, right? And what happens when you look all over the place, you finally find a plug, you plug in the phone, but the plug is dead. And these are the type of disciples that were in the land. They had the title of disciple. They had the title of follower of Christ. But when they encountered Paul, Paul said, there's no power in you. Mm, is that too strong? There's no power in you. See, we need power because there's a demand on the church. We need power because there's a demand on pastoral leadership. We need power because there's a demand on a father. We need power because there's demand on a mother. We need power because there's demand on a community. Can I hear an amen? And what we have here at Victory Arch is we want to raise up not just leaders who've been through classes. And we don't want to just raise up leaders that have been dipped in water. We want leaders that have been dipped in the power of the Holy Ghost. We want leaders that have been dipped in oil. Can I hear an amen? That when that person encounters you, they don't encounter encounter a title and a good look they recognize that there's power flowing out of your life there's an anointing flowing out of your life is there anyone here this morning that says i want to tap into the holy ghost see we need power a church without the holy spirit is a powerless church a church without the holy spirit see i believe that a truly effective church that promotes change cannot promote change without the promise of power. We can't just sit here and say, okay, you're going to change, but not present any power to you. We can't promise change without the promise of the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit that releases the power for change. And see, maybe that's why so many church people struggle. Have you met them? They go to church every week. They're in church every week, but they're still bound. They go to church every week. They just can't get enough of it, but they're still struggling. They're still smoking cigarettes, and they're still cussing, and they still can't get along with people. And, and, and they're in church, though. They're in church, though, and they come to church, though, but they're still struggling. They're still hooked up on stuff. They're still uh, dipping and dabbing. I don't got any people like that here this morning. <laughs> come on, somebody. Because we want change, but we recognize that we need power to experience the change. And so many people in church, they, they come to church, but they walk in bondage. And I've had to ask myself this question, why does that happen? I believe it happens because these people are not being unashamedly taught that there's a greater power. Notice the word unashamedly. Because sometimes you can go to a church that's ashamed to talk about the Holy Ghost. You can go to a church that's ashamed to speak in, in that heavenly language, speak in tongues. You can go to a church that no, believes that miracles are no longer present and that the age of the apostles has come to the end. Well, let me tell you, if you believe like that, you're in the wrong church this morning. Because this is a church that unashamedly believes that the power of God is still moving in 2018. And we're not going to hold back from teaching you that the Holy Ghost is real and the Holy Ghost is powerful and God can still heal your body and God can still restore your mind. And God, is there anyone here that believes that God still does miracles, believes that you're in the right church this morning? We are not ashamed of the gospel, and we are not ashamed of the Holy Spirit. 
Somebody say amen. amen. We're not ashamed to teach you that there is a power that is greater than drugs. We are not ashamed to teach you that there is a power that's greater than sex. We are not ashamed to teach you that there is a power that's greater than money. That power is called the Holy Spirit. That power is the sweet oil of heaven. That power is able to fill you up this morning. That power is able to change your situation. The Holy Spirit is in victory outreach this morning. And the Holy Spirit wants to send revival. We are not ashamed. See, why has the church walked away from the Holy Spirit? Because they say time has changed. Times has changed. Don't talk about the Holy Spirit. People are more sophisticated now. But their sophistication has led them to greater bondage and greater ignorance. And I believe with all of my heart that a church that walks away from the Holy Spirit sentences people to death. They say times have changed. Don't talk about miracles, Pastor. Don't talk about the supernatural, Pastor. Don't bring the healing evangelist, Pastor. Don't bring, don't lay hands on nobody, Pastor. Come on, help me. If, you, if you're with me, at least help me a little. Come on, does anybody believe that the Holy Spirit is able to still move? <laughs> Say, don't bring the healing evangelist, Pastor. Don't bring in more Cirillo next week. Come on, somebody. Well, I want to tell you that the power of God is still real. And miracles have not passed us by. Miracles are still for today. And Victory Outreach still believes in miracles. And if you've forgotten about miracles and leave this service and go look in the mirror and recognize you are a miracle. You are a treasure out of darkness. You are somebody that God delivered. See, the church wants to just focus on two areas of Jesus' ministry, teaching and evangelism. But they forget that Jesus also healed the sick and delivered those who were desperately bound. In the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Look at this. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. But look, it goes on. It says, and he, he has sent me. Look at this. To heal. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Isn't that what we did at Code Red? He also has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. Man, that sounds like miracle power to me. And to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Don't just tell me that Jesus came to teach and evangelize. 70% of that mission statement has to do with miracles, has to do with healing, has to do with setting people free. If you've been set free by the power of God, then take a moment and praise him for it and, and thank him for it and recognize that, guess what? You're going to be the healer. You're going to be the one that's going to bring the breakthrough to somebody who's lost this summer. Come on, somebody, and thank the Lord that we still believe in his power. How many know it's real? Look at what Paul said. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and power. Paul, he didn't just believe in preaching. He believed in demonstration. It wasn't just about getting up here and giving a speech. But there was evidence after the speech. In fact, there's one story in Acts where Paul was was preaching long and strong into the midnight hour. And there was a young disciple sitting on a windowsill in the second story, and he fell asleep during the message. That's why some of you need to be careful not to fall asleep during my preaching. And the Bible says he fell out the window and he died. So what did Paul do? Paul didn't just keep on preaching. He was a demonstration preacher. 
He got off the pulpit, went outside. He saw the dead young man, laid hands on him, raised him from the dead, brought him back in the church, put him in a better chair, and he started doing the work of ministry again. Can I hear an amen? Come on, somebody. We're not just here to preach. We're here to move in the power of God. We're here to see people delivered. We're here to see people set free by the power of the Lord. You know, when Paul wrote that letter to the Corinthians, guess where he was? He was actually in Ephesus teaching in the school of Tyrannus. Remember I read about the school of Tyrannus? Two years teaching these disciples about spiritual power. Two years going deep and teaching them about the kingdom of God. For two years, not just getting heavy, but training them in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I believe the church needs. I believe that we need to move away from information and move into transformation. I, I believe we're too heady. Can I hear an amen? God doesn't want to grow your head. God wants to grow your heart this morning. Come on, somebody. God doesn't want to take you just from having head knowledge. He wants to pour out his spirit, and he wants to begin to move to you in a new and living way. Why can't you pray for the sick? Why can't you help people get out of prison? Why can't you pray for the drug addict and chains begin to fall off? It's not just the pastor with the power. God is raising up an army of disciples that understand that the miracles are still for today, and God wants to use you. Oh, my God. Come on and praise him right now. I believe God's speaking to you. So here's Paul in the school of Tyrannus. Let me put it this way. Here's Paul in the family life flow. Teaching and raising up disciples for two years. Can I hear an amen? We got our own school of Tyrannus. Come on, somebody. We're raising up powerful disciples. And here's Paul teaching them and training them. And I believe he gets inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he, he writes to Corinthians and says, hey, guys, listen, don't just preach. Move in the power. Right. Tell your neighbor, move in the power. Come on, tell him, move in the power. Whew. Things will get better when you start moving in the power. See, there's three powerful things that disciples know when it comes to the power of God. Number one, write this down, then I'll be done. They know, are there any disciples here today? Okay. There's three things every disciple knows about the power. Number one, they know what the power is for. They know what the power is for. Book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In the Greek, the word power is the word dunamis, dunamis power. Dunamis is where we get the word dynamite. When you think of dynamite, what do you think of? Explosion. The Holy Spirit will create an explosion in your life. It's the Holy Spirit that causes good things in your life to begin to explode. It's the dunamis power <clears throat> that sets you on fire for God. And what we should learn here. And what every disciple knows is that the Holy Spirit brings explosion in the areas that glorify God's purpose and not ours. The Holy Spirit is not for your purpose. The Holy Spirit is to fulfill God's purpose. Are you hearing me? He gives us his spirit to fulfill his purpose. And when you are doing your own will, you don't need the power of God. I say it again, when you're doing your own will, and you're doing your own thing, and you're knowing rebellion to God, and you're knowing you're, you're, you're knowingly going in reverse, talk to me now. You don't need the anointing. You don't need the Holy Spirit. There was a movie that came out a few years back entitled, I Can Do Bad All By Myself. Some of you saw that movie. Some of you right now are starring in that movie. And when you can do bad all by yourself, you don't need the Holy Spirit. You don't need the Holy Spirit to make you go in reverse. See, but the power of God, watch this, and this will bring you hope, becomes manifest when you decide to follow God's will. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to do his will. 
It becomes manifest in particular areas of your life. Last week I mentioned that when your character is being tested, it gives you perseverance, right? When you're under attack, it gives you, it gives you might in, in the spirit. There's a lot of things it does. But, w- but the question that I have for you this morning is this, and it's a critical question. What has God been asking you to do? What has God been asking you to do? Now, I know what God's asking me to do. When I wake up in the morning, I know what I'm supposed to do when I I'm here this morning. And I'm here and I'm doing it because I know what God has asked me to do. I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm, and, and when I don't feel like doing what I know I'm supposed to do, that's when the Holy Spirit shows up. Because I step out to do it anyways. Not in my power, but in his power. Come on. And that's why I asked you that question. What has God called you to do? What is he asking you to do? He's been asking you to do something. He's been asking you to go deeper. He's been challenging you in some area of your life. He, he's saying, I want you to take a step. I want you to go forward. I want you to come out of this relationship. I want you to come out of this sin. I want you to make this change in your life. I want you to get better in this area. See, I know what God is asking me to do, but what is God asking you to do? Now, some of you say, I don't know. Then that, That's why you're not growing. Because if you're growing, you're understanding that the Holy Spirit is always leading you somewhere. The Holy Spirit is always wooing you. The Holy Spirit is always drawing you. The Holy Spirit is always saying, come on, let's go. Come on, let's go. Come on, don't get satisfied. Come on, don't get stuck. But I'm afraid. But I'm afraid. But I don't want to do it. But I failed last time. And and God's saying, I've given you the Holy Spirit. And in your weakness, the Holy Spirit will make you strong. The Holy Spirit will be there for you. The Holy Spirit will give you the dunamis power. There will be an explosion in your life. I'll set you on fire. Come on and Say amen. I'll help you do God's will. What's God asking you to do? You see, his power is there for you. So every disciple does great things because they know that the power is available. Tell your neighbor the power is available. What's the second thing every powerful disciple knows? Is they know who can move in the power. They not only know what the purpose of the power is, but they know who can move in the power. And that's a good question. Who, who has the right to move in the power of the Holy Spirit? Who has the right to call on the Holy Spirit? Who has the right to do miracles? Is it just the pastor? Who has the right to move in the supernatural? Well, those who can move in the power of God are those who are cleansed by the blood of Jesus, but secondly, those who are cultivating a relationship with the Lord. Okay? You got to be cleansed, but you also got to be cultivating. Tell your neighbor, you got to be cultivating. See, to be a disciple, a real disciple, not just with title and a diploma, and a few Veti units under your belt, but who wants to be a real disciple? Okay, all right, all right. Well, if you don't want it, it's okay. I, I mean, you don't. Then you need to be cultivating your relationship with God. Every, every disciple needs a prayer life. Every disciple must have a time of prayer. Every disciple must pray. We don't pray because we must. We pray because we need the Lord daily. We, we need the Lord daily. How many of you really need the Lord daily? Well, listen, as the Lord starts using you more and more, you're going to come to find that you don't just need the Lord daily. You need the Lord hourly. Because there's a demand on people. There's a a demand on a disciple. There's a demand on a parent. There's a demand on a pastor. There's a demand on a leader. And when that demand begins to grow, praying once a day is not enough. Paul said to stay in a spirit of prayer. He said, he says, he says, uh, to, what did he say again? 
Pray without ceasing. I'm sorry. Pray without ceasing, meaning don't stop praying. Stay in a spirit of prayer. Don't just pray in the morning, but walk in prayer. Pray over every issue. Pray every time they put pressure on you. Pray every time you got a challenge to tackle. Come on, somebody. Need a sermon? Pray. Need to talk to someone on the phone? Pray. You feel like the cops are following you? Pray. Can I hear an amen? Why do we got to pray? Because there's a demand on a church. There's a demand on the leader. There's a demand on a generation. And we're the ones that God wants to use. So we've got to learn to pray. We've got to respond to that demand. See, we've got to pray. We've got to have a relationship with the Lord. Why do we need that relationship? Because, because you know, uh, let me put it this way. I didn't say this in the first service, but I'll just put it this way because I'm kind of feeling comfortable right now. But the devil is not the punk we claim him to be. Whoever called the devil a punk? But how many know he's much stronger than what you think? And in the book, in the, in the Acts 19, we, we read in verse 13 through 16, that there was these Jewish leaders that got all caught up in the hype. All caught up in the hype of miracles being released. All got caught up in the hype, that, in the notoriety that came along with it, with the fame that came along with it. Just like some young preachers and young people, they see us doing all this. Say, ooh, wouldn't that be nice to get up there and to preach and talk to all these people? And, and wouldn't it be nice to get on a flyer? Wouldn't it be nice to get in the ministry? And, and, and sometimes our heart's not right towards it. And these leaders, these Jewish leaders, got all wrapped up in the hype. So they went out and they started to try to cast out demons. But this is how they did it. They went out and says, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches... And what the Bible tells us is they tried to move in the power of God illegally. Come on, somebody. There's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And let me tell you the wrong way to do it. You'll never kill a devil with a religious spirit. Religious people can't kick the devil out the family. I don't care how many signs of how many crosses you do and how many candles you do and how many idols you have up in your house of the virgin and St. Jude and all that kind of stuff. Religion ain't going to get the job done. It's going to be a Christian that's been dipped in the anointing, a Christian that's praying and cultivating a relate. Oh. oh, come on and give him praise right now. You need to pray. What happened? What happened to these Jewish leaders? They tried to cast out the demon. <laughs> it's a funny story. It really. And, and then the spirit rose up and, and then and they and look what they said, man. See, they were not in relationship. They were trying to do it illegally. The, the demons look at them and they says, uh, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But who in the heck are you? Because even the devil knows what a real disciple looks like. Are there any real disciples at Victory Outreach San Diego this morning that have been dipped in the fire of the Holy Ghost? And you know what happened? The devil, the, the, the spirits came up and they slapped those guys around and kicked them and pulled their pants down, gave them a wedgie and... It's kind of funny, but then it's not if you're trying to do spiritual battle in the flesh. And what am I saying to you is that you need a relationship with the Lord, new person. What am I saying to you, old person that lost the fire and the devil is kicking you up and down the street? You need to get back to your relationship with the Lord. What am I saying to those of you Christians that are here but you're struggling with things in your life and you can't get free, you, you, it's okay to be dipped in water, but get dipped in oil. It's okay to be dipped in water, but get dipped in fire again. Ask the Lord to give you a new baptism this morning. 
He said, oh, but you don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. The fire will burn the sin away. The fire will burn the chains. The fire will burn the bondage. He wants to give you fire. He wants to pour out his spirit. The Bible says in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your young men will prophesy. Your old men and women will dream dreams. Come on, somebody. Who wants a fresh outpouring? Who wants a fresh anointing? Who wants to be dipped again? Come on, somebody. This scripture tells us right here, I'm almost done, that we can't go try to do it messing around in the flesh. We can't just be religious. We can't walk in the flesh and expect great spiritual results. Enemy's too strong. Enemy's too strong for your fleshly methods. Even Satan knows the difference between a real disciple with power and a powerless disciple. Can we give God one more praise? I'm done. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to ask the keyboard player to come, Matthew. We're talking about the power. The third thing a real disciple knows is not only what the power is for, not only who can move in the power, but thirdly, Every disciple knows what the power of God does. What the, what the power of God does. How many know that when, when, when the power of God falls, things begin to happen? Uh, is that good news? When, when the power of God shows up, what, what happens? I'll tell you right now. The kingdom prevails. When the power of God shows up, victory is won. Ooh. See, you're at home and you're trying to lead your family, stuff going on. And, 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 and when the power of God shows up, it's like when the, when the presence of God filled the upper room. The Bible says it was like the sound of a mighty mushy regiment. It just came in. And, and when the power of God shows up, that's when the victory shows up. That's when the kingdom begins to prevail. That's when the devil's put back in his place. Come on, somebody. Every disciple knows and needs the power of God because that's when the enemy can be defeated. That's when change can happen. And I think even some Christians, you know, you know, you hear and but you need to change. You need change. You need something, man. You're like, this is not feeling the same. It's not feeling the same. Serving God's not feeling the same. Ministry's not feeling the same. Leadership's not feeling the same. I don't know if I was thinking the wrong way when I got into it, but it's not feeling the same. And the reason it's not feeling the same is because the Holy Spirit is not there. And we need the Holy Spirit to come back into our ministry and our life in full force. Because when the power of God shows up, that's when everything, I said everything, begins to change. That's when real, real transformation happens. Transformation. That, that's why I think some of us, we, we, the, the hype wore out. In Victor, I just say, the honeymoon's over. And things change in that way. And then you know whether you have religion or relationship. And what we need and what we should desire in our life is transformation. Something's got to change. Something's got to be different. Something's got to happen. When the power of God shows up, that's when legion can be kicked out of the region. Legion. You know, you know who legion is? That demon, right? Remember? The Gadarene demoniac. Jesus fed the 5,000, crossed the Sea of Galilee, encountered 
the gathering demoniac was cutting himself, chained with all these chains. They didn't know what to do with them. They locked him in a cave. Jesus set him free. A thousand demons came out of him. And when the power of God shows up, that's when legion can come out. <laughs> but not just kick him out of your life and kick him out of your home. But let's kick him out of the city. Come on, somebody. Come on, how many want to see the devil just kicked out of our neighborhood? Can't do it with religion. We've got to be dipped in the power. Dipped in the power of God. How do we know that happened? Because in, 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 in Acts 19.19, 19, the community had some serious change. In verse 19, it says, And also those who practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it told 50,000 pieces of silver. My God. 50,000 pieces of silver. That's how many books of magic, charms, idols, Aztec calendars. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Shoot, even burn the Pandaria calendar you get from the, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> my grandma had one of those every time and, and, and take all that and, and they took it and it equaled 50,000 pieces of silver that's even a lot of money today I mean I have a little roll of silver dollars and it's worth about $3,000 just that imagine 50,000 pieces of silver how many know that's some change that's some transformation that people were willing to give up their livelihood to serve the Lord. I don't know about you, but I don't want hype anymore. I want to see real change in people's lives. How many want to see some real change in people's lives? I'm talking real, real change. I was preaching in a church not too long ago, another church, another ministry, and I was saying, you know what, God wants to bring change. And some of you, man, you need, you need to throw the things that are holding you back on the altar. In the story, they took all the books and burned them, right? And I think if you want to set yourself on fire, you got to burn some stuff. And I said, some of you are going to take, you know, things that have been holding you back and throw them right up here. Just throw them up here. I'm up here. Just throw them. That's how we do it in Victory Outreach, man. Just throw it on the altar. Throw it on the stage. Were you there with me, Algie? I said, you got cigarettes? Throw them up here, man. I go, some of you need to get your phone and throw it up here. Just... And man, I, 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 I'll do his there. The power guy showed up so strong, people started throwing whole packs of cigarettes on the altar. Crumbled up camels and, you know, whatever was up. I just remember seeing camels and Marlboro. People were throwing their phones up there, putting their phones up on the altar. I saw a pipe, someone threw a marijuana pipe up there. I was waiting for the guns and knives. I didn't see any. But I said, you, you, if you want revival to come, you got to get that stuff out of your life. You, you got to be baptized again. You need a fresh anointing. Come on, Victory Outreach. And how many know God wants to give us a fresh anointing? And, and that, that's the fourth thing I want to share with you as you stand. It's not only they know what the power does, but the fourth and critical question is this. Who wants the power? Because not everybody wants the power. Not everybody wants the oil. They want water, but they don't want the oil. They want the image of being changed, but they don't want the real change. And I'm going to tell you what gives you the real change is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That if you were here today and you say, man, pastor, that was a powerful message for me. And I know God's called me to be a disciple, but I need the anointing. I, I need the power of God in my life. I, I need that power to be released. I don't know who you are or, or where you're at in your life right now. But all I know is that the Holy Spirit is available to you. Available to you. You say, I, I really want to step into change and transformation. And if you're here this morning, I... I'm going to ask them, them to minister in song. 
set an environment for the Holy Ghost. I know some of you have to go home, but, but if you could stay a few more minutes and, and let the Holy Spirit touch you, let the Holy Spirit anoint you with power. Those of you that graduated the family life flow, I, I think every one of you should be at this altar. Because it's only the Holy Spirit that's going to bring that total change and transformation in your life and empower you. Because the Holy Spirit will empower you as well. Can you just lift up your hands right now? Lift up your hands and talk to the Lord right now in your own way.